All right. Well, hopefully uh, this is working. Uh, this is Nick from HoneyPoint 3D, and I welcome you to our first webinar for our uh, Mesh Mixer Kickstarter. Uh, and I know that Lisa is also, uh, as one of the attendees here, she wanted to kind of test out how to uh, um, join as an attendee. So she is uh, generally on the uh, webinar as well. Uh, but again, uh, you know me, uh, my name is Nick Klosky, and I want to very personally thank you for backing our Kickstarter. Uh, as you know, we were uh, about 178% funded, so uh, that is super, super awesome, and we really, really appreciate all of the feedback and the good reviews that we have been getting on um, our course and the 101 course as we've come out with it. So we, we super want to appreciate all of you, our cool backers. Uh, this will also be broadcast after the fact. So for you watching this non-live, uh, we want to make sure that this technology works for you. So please send us emails uh, or contact us at info at honeypoint3d um, with any suggestions on how we can make these webinars more useful uh, for people. So I have, uh, I've enabled chat. Uh, I see the Lisa said hi, Louis. Um, and I guess Lewis is saying uh, a sound check. Uh, hopefully people can can hear me. Lisa said that, that she can hear me. Uh, but this is a new platform for us, so hopefully this, this works out. It's roughly based on Google Hangouts, but um, it has some kind of wrappers around it to make it a little bit easier. Uh, but there is a chat uh, that you can use, and uh, I would encourage you to ask questions. Uh, a number of you did send in questions beforehand, so I will totally address those. We had kind of a wide variety of um, questions on Mesh Mixer and 3D printing and all of that. So uh, I want to just kind of reiterate that HoneyPoint 3D is training. Uh, we also do consultations, so we have to be kind of nimble on our feet about um, the types of questions that we get from customers. We've had uh, people interested in manufacturing, so we know a bit about how to advise people about proper materials to use on the 3D printing side, all the way to talking about workflows for how to use various pieces of software uh, most intelligently. Uh, so be sure to uh, ask questions on uh, the little chat box that uh, Lisa and Lewis um, have been using, and I will be sure to answer them. So I just kind of want to give an update on the class. Uh, as of yesterday, I think we had 46 uh, five-star reviews, so I uh, really, really appreciate that. Um, if you haven't reviewed the course yet, uh, I would really, really encourage you to do so. Uh, hopefully it's a positive review, um, and if it's anything less than five stars, uh, we really want to make the class uh, good and useful for you. So if you think that you would use uh, or you would give a review that's anything less than perfect, then um, let us know. And we want to try to give you the information that you need so that we can earn a uh, good review from you. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, left a review, uh, you don't have access to the mind map. So that's one of the first things that I did want to show you of how to use that resource um, and how it can be a little bit maybe more easy for you to use if you don't want to jump into a video. So if I uh, go here, I want to try to uh, do a screen share here. And let me share my screen. And I will go here to the mind map. Here we go. So this is our uh, mind map. Hopefully you all can still see it. Uh, this is arranged in a way that is just like the Mesh Mixer interface. So on the left-hand side, you see down Mesh Mixer, uh, Select, Sculpt, Edit, Shaders, and Analysis. So this is a, uh, it's actually a very nice program. It's actually a very comprehensive mind map. Um, so if you click on one of these, these are all of the second level menus that fly out for edit, modify, convert to, brush options, select brushes. So this is su assuming that you've clicked select and you've painted something on your mesh. Um, you get these options. So edit, um, let's just click on extract, and you get a little image of what extract does with some 
shortcuts. I'll bring this here over into the center. Shortcuts. You can double click on, or actually single click on any of the images in there to get a large image that I've done a screenshot of to show what that tool does. So this is the extract tool that essentially copies the selected part of the mesh and extracts it out. And you can close that and go back. So this is a very nice resource for you um, that will be updated over time. So as new features come out, uh, we will analyze the new features and uh, put them into this tool. So again, something like tube handle comes out and click on it and it, you know, tube handle essentially puts a, a hole through your mesh. So this is all uh, open and waiting for you if you uh, leave a good review. And what we'll do is uh, I will go here and stop screen sharing and come back. Uh, so that is waiting for you uh, if you uh, leave a review on, on the class. And we uh, uh, think it actually provides quite a bit of value. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you do that. Um, and again, if any of you have any questions, uh, please ask them in the chat box. Uh, but so what I'll do is uh, I want to make sure that I get to your questions in this training uh, session. So we received actually quite a bit of questions here on my other screen uh, from the survey response. So I want to kind of go through those. Um, and if anything pops up to you, please ask those in the chat box. Um, the first question uh, was from Bill, and uh, uh, Bill asked a question about um, wanting inside information on Mesh Mixer's roadmap um, and how to influence its future and features. Uh, so if some of you didn't know the history of Mesh Mixer, it started out as um, essentially a one person's project, um, a guy named Ryan, uh, Ryan Schmidt. Uh, not affiliated with Autodesk at all, uh, came out with Mesh Mixer and was working on it, and people found it really, really cool um, and useful. And uh, Autodesk found that it was so useful that um, they brought Mesh Mixer into the 123D apps portfolio. So if I go back here, I'm going to go back to a screen share and uh, just share this screen. And I'm going to go back to the Mesh Mixer website. There's a couple of different Mesh Mixer websites. One is just meshmixer.com, and then the other one is the Autodesk uh, 123D app website. But on here, if you click on Forum, you just get to a normal forum uh, for Mesh Mixer uh, and the questions and troubleshooting. You can see this one with 1,600 posts is the main one. And you go here, and I've asked a question right here. Um, there's quite a bit of um, help you can get on this website. But let's go to one with um, a good number of replies, maybe navigation curiosity. Um, this is a good, a really good example of what goes on on this forum. There are um, a couple of users you would want to pay attention to. So this person. Uh, uh, Gastonioni, I guess. Um, sometimes when I'm moving around a model, I can move right through the surface into the interior, right? So they had a, a question about navigation. Um, this person right here, RMS, is Ryan Schmidt. So he is the person who wrote Mesh Mixer. Uh, so when you see RMS on the website, um, you are interacting directly with the writer and designer of Mesh Mixer. Uh, Mesh Mixer is not a huge team inside of Autodesk. Um, but you do get direct feedback into uh, the person who's creating uh, Mesh Mixer on this forum. So that's RMS. Uh, the other person you'd want to actually look for um, in the forums is this guy right here, MagWeb. His name is Gunter. Um, he is an absolute expert um, in Mesh Mixer, and he helps tons and tons of people um, on the uh, on the forums, he is uh, um, anytime he posts on your uh, on your forum, uh, it's pretty much guaranteed to be right. He is a very very good resource that just devotes his time to help people on the Mesh Mixer forum. So RMS and Magweb are the two main people you can uh, you can look at. There we go. Uh, so in my estimation, uh, uh, Ryan is actually very very responsive to 
the people that post on the forum. So if you select, uh, um, talk about ideas or suggest things that he should work on, um, I have seen those uh, within one release cycle come into the program. So uh, that would be uh, that would be the way to do it. Um, so Lewis said that you uh, can't see anything. Um, hopefully, uh, are you guys able to see the uh, uh, screenshots when I go into like the forums and things like that? It would be awesome if you could comment there. Um, and Lewis also asked if this will be online for viewing. Uh, the question is yes. So this is um, this is going to be uh, recorded. And then after the webinar is over, this webinar software will actually send you a link to the recording to see for yourself. So um, hopefully everybody can see this and maybe it's just something that we could work out with Lewis a little bit later. Uh, so hopefully that answered Bill's question. Um, Let's see, we got another question um, from Peter, uh, an RC plane and drone hobbyist. Uh, Peter is. Um, and interested in how Mesh Mixer can uh, be used to augment uh, drone type things. So uh, there's actually a few, a few ways to answer that. Uh, there are lots of resources online for drone parts. And um, I've shown some of those in the class itself. But just a very quick way, I'll go to the screen share again here and I will go here to Thingiverse and do a search for drone. So there's different drone parts. Uh, so this is right here, the Parrot AR Drone Replacement Part Pack, right? So if we look in here under Thing Files, let's just go down here to allparts.stl and download it. Shouldn't take that long to, uh, to download. Um, so certainly Mesh Mixer can help with this. Let me actually bring up Mesh Mixer now. And I'll make the window a little bit smaller once it thinks about opening that file. I'll just take a second to open here. Um, so this is what I would do. I don't actually own a drone. I would love to have one, um, but someday I may own one. But this is kind of what I would do, right? Is I would uh, go and find some, here we go. Uh, some parts online, let me kind of make this smaller here. I would go find some parts online and then download them and modify them for what I would need. Um, so now Mesh Mixer has shown that there are some issues with this, right? So this would be the first thing that I talk about in the class is that when you get things that are downloaded online, they can come with some issues. Um, so these are huge issues right here. Let me put the Mesh Mixer shader on them. Uh, which brings me to another thing. Uh, the latest version of Mesh Mixer uh, gives some very nice uh, new features. And one of them is the back faces are now shaded. So instead of just having a uniform pink color, you get these bands on it. So this is a huge problem uh, with this model is that these are all have their normals reversed, which isn't a good thing at all. So this would actually take quite a bit of fixing to do. Uh, what we could try to do is go into the select tool, click on allow back faces, and just click once on this. Uh, so I select it on the inside and say, um, what we would actually want to do is go and essentially uh, um, expand this selection out to all connected triangles. Now I certainly could kind of try to scrub on here um, and try to select everything, but that's not necessarily the uh, the most accurate way of doing that. You can go up here to modify and say expand to connect it. So now um, I've expanded it here. And what we can try to do is flip the normals um, on these. Uh, it might be kind of hard to do, um, but we go up here to edit to say flip normals. And now these are somewhat fixed. Right, so uh, this is a nice gray color outside of here. Um, you still have a ton of problems. So these, let me zoom in here a little bit. Uh, these are all uh, kind of open areas that Mesh Mixer says are problems to fix. The blue areas are also open areas. Let me zoom in here, uh, are also open areas. So this is just a mess um, of a mesh 
Um, but anyway, this is something that you could download and you could start changing the sizes of these um, different poles and, and uh, kind of rods to fit for your drone by selecting it, enlarging it, um, or just modeling it somewhere else and then bringing it in to use um, their propellers with your poles. So let me go back and uh, like that effect there. Um, good. So people are able to uh, see and hear and, and all of that. So that's uh, that's great. Uh, so it, that is generally what I, what I would do, right? Is um, for things like drones, uh, what I might do is, I talked about this in the class, I wouldn't necessarily go and um, do that inside of Mesh Mixer because something like a drone needs very, very specific sized parts to maybe fit into little connectors. Um, what I would use for that is Fusion 360 to create just the connector parts that I needed. And then I would maybe bring it into Mesh Mixer to create the more organic shapes. Um, and this is what I talked about in that hybrid modeling uh, section in the class, is that Mesh Mixer is good for some things, but if you're trying to create um, a hole that is maybe two millimeters wide, you can do that. But then if you go and try to change it to 2.1 or 2.2 millimeters later, um, it starts to get a little bit harder to do that. And that is where something like Fusion 360 uh, would be very, very useful to do. And you can always bring it in from Fusion um, into Mesh Mixer for later editing. Uh, so if Peter, uh, if you're on, um, I'm not able to see if you are on, but if you're on, um, you can ask some more questions to have me try to elaborate on that. But I wanna make sure that I get through everybody's questions um, more, uh, most efficiently. Uh, so we do have a question on Mesh Mixer basics. I'll go over that um, in the lighter part of the uh, webinar. But um, so we had a, a question from Brent uh, about the pros and cons of the various materials and the best uses of each type of uh, PLA, ABS, um, size limitations for mesh mixer, slicer software, uh, actually quite, quite a whole lot. Um, and smart or not so obvious tips for successful prints at all stages. Uh, so it's kind of like everything with 3D printing. Um, hopefully you saw the uh, the 3D printing course and that helped you a little bit. But um, generally I print with two different materials. Uh, I'm not sure if I have any right here. No, they're, they're actually in the other room. Um, I print with PLA and uh, PET. So uh, PLA is polylactic acid. It's the most common type of 3D printer material for the fused deposition modeling machines. So these are the ones that use the filament that goes in. So PLA, um, I usually have some sort of print with PLA around me, but I don't, I don't right now. Um, but PLA is polylactic acid, so it's biodegradable, um, which means uh, that it is actually it prints very, very well. It's the perfect starter material. But there are some times when you wouldn't want to use PLA. Uh, since PLA is biodegradable, you want to make sure that when you are printing um, with any specific material, you take into account what it's going to be used for, right? So since it is biodegradable, um, I wouldn't use PLA for anything that will be installed outside for any uh, long length of time. Now, a PLA part won't biodegrade over the course of a week or a month um, or maybe even six months, uh, but over time it will degrade. And so you wouldn't want to, uh, to use that in any place where it gets wet uh, or anything like that. PLA inside a house will last a decade or more, uh, no problems there. PLA does biodegrade. Um, one other thing is that pretty much no 3D printing material that is common is UV resistant. Um, so outside, if it's something is going to be in bright light, um, every material, even ABS, all of that will get degraded by uh, ultraviolet light from the sun. So that's just another thing to think about as well. Uh, so I print with PLA. And um, I don't print with ABS because ABS uh, stands for acrylonitrilbutadiene styrene. Um, that last part, the styrene, uh, when you print with it, uh, low quality ABS really, really smells like a burning styrofoam cup. 
Um, high quality ABS only slightly smells like a burning styrofoam cup. Um, and I don't want to smell any of that at all. I don't think it's healthy for me. Um, and Lisa would agree. And, and so uh, I just don't print with it. What I do print with is PET, polyethylene terephthalate. Um, it's what soda bottles are made of. Um, the, and actually I can go show you. Let me show you here. Um, so I get my PET from a, a company actually out here in the San Francisco Bay Area called Made Solid. Um, they're also a resin manufacturer. Um, but if you go here to PET filament, um, it's actually really, really good. Um, it tends to cost a double that that PLA does, though. Uh, so uh, a one-pound spool will be about thirty-five dollars instead of a two uh, or two-point-two pound spool uh, costing thirty-five. Um, but it's very nice. Uh, it prints very, very durable parts. And uh, I will go back here and stop there. Uh, and it prints very, very durable parts. So when would you use one or the other? I um, actually got a question uh, about that the other day. PLA is great. What PLA does is it's very, very stiff. Um, so it really, really won't give. It won't give. Uh, it won't give until it's essentially snaps and shatters. So if you need something that needs to be very, very strong um, in terms of not bending and very, very rigid, PLA is great. But when it gets up to its uh, 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 tensile strength or its its failure level, um, it will just snap and crack and break because it's essentially sugar shattering. Um, if you've ever eaten a creme brulee, right, the, the top of that is a very hard uh, caramelized sugar, but then once it breaks, it just snaps. Same thing with PLA. Uh, so that's one thing. If you need a very, very strong parts, um, PLA is great for that. But if you need something that's a little bit more um, resistant to flex, um, then uh, actually if you go into Made Solid site, um, they'll see uh, demonstrations about how they compare it to ABS, and it actually is better than ABS, according to them, um, in a lot of ways. Um, so what PLA, uh, what ABS and uh, PET do is they will flex. You will get some flex, and then when they break, they'll just start to fissure and then peel and then break, right? So you get some warning uh, before the part fails. So if you were doing something for... Um, you, like a bicycle outdoors, um, and you didn't care about having it biodegrade or not, uh, like maybe a GoPro mount or something like that, uh, the repetitive bouncing of a bike, a road bike, or a mountain bike um, with a GoPro on it would flex the, uh, the object quite a bit if you're going over rough road. And for something like that, I might think that something like ABS or uh, PET would be a better choice than PLA. Um, you know, PLA would work fine, but you just get more bounces and then more stress and fatigue over time. So that's a little bit about, um, sorry about that. Um, that's a little bit about um, uh, some of the common materials that you uh, can print with. Um, there's other ones, you know, flexible filaments and, and, and uh, more exotic ones, but those are the main ones that I print with. Um, so uh, size limitations for mesh mixer. Um, mesh mixer, uh, it, it actually, all 3D files are very interesting. Um, and actually, let me bring up mesh mixer and give you an example of, of what this is. So I will screen share again. We will go into infinity here, and I will go up and start up mesh mixer. And let me make this a little bit smaller and put it in the center here. Um, so we'll just bring in the bunny and fix the bunny. So right now, um, there's a couple different ways, and this is something that's kind of hard to talk about in the class, is um, we click on units dimensions. This is the bounding box for the bunny, right? So 51 millimeters by 50 by 39. Um, you know, if I say that this is 100 millimeters, everything will scale, but you notice nothing um, changed. Like the bunny didn't suddenly like grow huge in my screen or anything like that. I just changed the bounding box. Whereas if we go into something if, like if I press the T key for transform and I use the little uh, white box right here in the center to grow it, you see I am making it larger, right? Both have the same effect, but 
what this does is when we go into analysis units dimensions, um, we say like 100 millimeters. If I say 100 inches, Mesh Mixer will ask if I want to keep XYZ the same or convert it. Um, so if we say keep the same, 100 millimeters becomes 100 inches. If I export this though, and actually let me let me do this. We say export. Um, I'm going to export it as an STL ASCII to my desktop as the bunny. Let me bring up um, just the Notepad app, and we'll open on my desktop here the bunny. Right, so this is, uh, which I talked about in my 101 class, um, what an STL file looks like. All it is is just uh, points in space um, with the outer loop of three creating a triangle, and then another triangle, and then another triangle, and you can see a lot, 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 lot of triangles. But there is nowhere in here that says that this is modeled in millimeters or inches or meters. It could be modeled in light years. It doesn't matter. Um, when you go to a website like, and let me come back to you here. There we go. Um, when we go to uh, a website like Shapeways, that's why it asks you, is it modeled in inches or millimeters? Because most 3D files have no um, inbuilt measurement system. So, you know, it could be, it's one unit, one unit of inches, one unit of millimeters. You need to tell the software what it will be in the physical world. So there's no size limits on Mesh Mixer in terms of physical size. Um, there would be limits to your computer if you were measuring, uh, uh, creating something that was 15 meters wide and you wanted to build support structures for it, that is, uh, kind of an integration between virtual and physical, where it has to actually think about the size of the support structures that go up and, <coughs> excuse me, and the uh, um, uh, the computer has to figure out, you know, how many support structures to fit in a given area. Um, so that can cause your computer to, to slow down. But I've also worked on meshes that are I don't know, uh, 3 million, 4 million polygons, and it slows down my computer, but it totally works. So um, no size issues there. Hold on one second. Hopefully you didn't hear that. Um, great. So let's go to, um, and again, if any of you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them in the chat. And let us go here. So smart tips at all stages here. Let me just get some water. Hold on. So smart and not so obvious tips for successful prints. Um, well, here's a good one, right? And I talk about this a little bit in the class. Uh, let me go back to Mesh Mixer here. Share my screen. And bring back up the bunny. Um, so, uh, so here's a tip I actually use quite a bit. Uh, we'll start with the bunny right here. <coughs> Click on overhangs. Um, and actually, it, it complained that the mesh is, is too large uh, because I changed the size. So let me just import the bunny again and replace it. There we go. So now we go to overhangs. Um, so we at an overhang level of, let's say, 30, which is getting a little bit more aggressive. Um, this is where support structures would be created. So we'll say done here. But if you looked at my overhang video, that actually is a persistent setting, that 30 degrees. So right here, we go to the shader with this little red bottom on the bottom, and we drag this in. So that remembers what the overhangs are. So some little tips is if I don't really care about the chin of this uh, bunny all that much, uh, what I can do is just go into maybe a sculpt tool, maybe with a draw, and, well, I have it set pretty aggressive here. Turn the strength down. Um, turn the strength down quite a bit. Make sure refinement. 
is somewhere up here. And I can just start clicking on this. And let's actually zoom in to the chin. And you see, as I'm drawing it out, I'm making only very, very slight changes to the mesh. But it's enough to prevent support structures from needing to be there. And I can even make my brush very, very small and just click once, right? Um, over here was the, was the first click. But that was a very small change to the bunny, which made it not need support structures. You know, same thing, we can go down here. You could see that the mesh is being refined a bit. Hold my mouse down on this. You can see that as this is, let me zoom in even more here. As it's kind of popping out here, I'm needing less and less support structures. So this is a really good tip for uh, making your designs a little bit more user-friendly when you actually go to 3D print them. Great, so let's go back. Great, uh, so that was a question for that. Um, and Brent, if you have any uh, more questions now or later, I'd be welcome to have you uh, ask them. So what else? Um, so we had a question from Lewis. Oh, yeah, I guess Lewis. Um, uh, models with multiple parts meshing in uh, into one, even if it doesn't intersect, um, or just taking the separate parts and selecting them and moving them and saving them separately. Okay, so very easy to do that. Let me go back to the bunny here. I'll just import a new bunny and repair it. Okay. Oh, nope, I need to actually share my screen for you to see that. So let's go back here and share it. There we go. Okay. Uh, so multiple parts. So let me go back to the mesh mixer shader. Uh, models with multiple parts uh, meshing into one, even if they don't intersect. So what I can do is with this bunny, go into edit to plane cut and just draw a line. I'm just clicking and drawing a line right here. And I'm going to uh, slice it. And I can say no fill, deal on A, or delete, refine. So I'm going to say delete, refine, and say accept. Looks like it didn't do anything, but if you press W, you actually see that there's a line inside of here. And here's another thing that I wanted to talk about in the class, uh, but it might not have come through. Uh, normally, if you want to select something, you can just kind of uh, select this and hit, um, and then double click, right? And it selects everything. Um, or you can select, you know, here and double click. Um, it's a shortcut. But it doesn't work when these two edges are touching. So um, I can kind of show you an example. If we use that slice command, let me get a better cut right here. So I'm going to select this and delete it. And I'm going to select this and delete it. So with that slice command, it's actually creating two surfaces here. And if you look inside, you can see that it's kind of like this shimmering effect because the triangles uh, for this one are facing inwards, but the triangles for here are smooshed up against there and facing that way as well. Um, so here, if you want to actually select one side of this bunny, uh, the better, well, the, the way that works, not the better way, the way that actually works is you just click here and then hit the E key, expand to connect it. If you don't do this, here's what happens. If you just double click, let me select and double click on this and hit the T key for transform and move it. Um, oh, actually, that was fixed. That was one of the bugs now that I reminded myself uh, that was fixed in 2.92, um, that this double clicking actually does work. In the previous version of Mesh Mixer, you would get this like pulling taffy thing. So that is, uh, um, I forgot, is something that was actually fixed inside of the latest version of Mesh Mixer. Um, but it's always a really good kind of a, a thing to remember is that uh, you can double click, but the E key is actually a better one. So we can go here and transform this and move it, right, as a separate body. Um, 
This is, if we go up here to View to Show Object Browser, oh, we actually have to accept that first. View, Show Object Browser. And this is another issue with, uh, um, with I guess, the newest version of Windows. Sometimes these windows kind of get caught like outside, and you have to resize a tiny bit of your window to get your object browser there. So we can say select. Um, we can click on this, hit E, and then transform it and move it away. Uh, and we click accept. But notice these are still the same inside the same container. Um, if I tried to save this, it would just save as a 3D mesh that is separated in 3D space. Um, and it would go into a 3D printer like this, which would be a very, very difficult 3D print to do. So what you can do is you say edit to separate the Y key. And you know this is selected. So once you separate it, you now have two objects. And you can click on them in the object browser. Now, this is something I talk about in the class as well. You go into File to Preferences, and you make sure that under File here, when you say Export, is Selection Only. So Selection Only means that only the thing that is selected here right now, which is the head of the bunny, will be exported. If it's Export Whole Scene, everything will get exported, and it's not really what you want. So right now, if you go to File to Export um, and say, bunny head as the desktop right there. Um, and we can actually go import it and replace it. We just have the bunny head. Um, so this is uh, a very useful thing when you're working with multiple objects. Um, and that's, that's essentially how you can do this. So um, it's very nice if you want to have a very complex model. Or actually, let me bring up this. So this was the uh, the the drone that we did before. Um, if we look and say show object browser here, again, it's not popping up. I have to kind of remove my window here. Um, it's just all one part, right? Even though I downloaded all of them. Uh, so what I can do is just say select and draw a box zoop, around those. And now all of these are selected. And we can go to edit to separate. And so instead of that, we will double click and say, here's. So now these are these are separated out. You can still totally work on other things inside of here, but the gears are separate, right? You can do uh, whatever you want. Again, sculpting with these will just kind of destroy them, you know, or crash because Mesh Mixers does sometimes crash. Um, but that's how you can separate parts out. So let me come back here. There we go. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, working with multiple parts um, is very useful with the object browser um, to just understand that they are containers that can be exported separately or, or uh, kind of kept as one. Um, and the object browser with separate parts allows you to use all of these attract tools to allow you to kind of suck one model into another and conform the shape, uh, things like that. So pretty cool. Um, so hopefully that answered your question, Lewis. Uh, we have a few more minutes to go. So we had a question uh, from um, Andrea. How about SLA DLP printing, uh, especially focused on the methods and tricks to orient objects and to correctly set up the support? Uh, great. No, so that's a good question as well. I'll go back and share my screen again and go back out to Mesh Mixer. Uh, so let me just bring in the bunny again. And fix the bunny with the inspector. So I've been actually playing around with a resin printer. Um, and uh, if you go into overhangs, there's actually settings up here under custom settings for um, the Autodesk Ember printer, which is a very special uh, specialized printer that has a small print area but is very, very detailed. But just the general SLA DLP printer. So let's click on that. Um, so this sets these different things, but if we say generate support, you'll see that the supports generated from this are very different than normal supports. 
so what this did is it set a Y offset because in a uh, resin printer, you never want your object touching the build plate because when you uh, remove it from the build plate, there's a tremendous amount of, of suction force that the resin puts um, on the build plate and you don't want to subject your model to that. So it sets a Y offset here for three millimeters because this is essentially printing like this in, uh, because, well, it's a general statement, but generally uh, the, the resin printers print upside down. So this would be against the build plate here and it would be printing downwards, creating this layer, this layer, this way, layer. Um, on an FDM printer, that's not the case. Um, it would print like this and we can just go to maybe Ultimaker settings. And you see the Ultimaker settings are very, very different. Um, just a couple little supports going up and your model is touching the build plate, no problem. But on an SLA printer, let me generate those again. There we go. Um, that's not the case. So this prints like this. And because this is going downwards, you need to pay into um, account um, kind of how the resin works with gravity, right? So there's a lot more supports here, but no supports here um, because this is working with gravity as it's coming down. So you don't really need supports um, at that area. And of course, you can add them in if you believe that these may be too heavy, you know, physically heavy that they might crack off. But um, the settings for this um, kind of are, are pretty well optimized. If you also note in here, you get these very, very sharp transitions here. DLP printers are fine printing very, very sharp transitions, also going down to extremely fine points. Uh, a point like this, zoom in even more, um, a point like this would be, uh, you might not get a very good effect with a an FDM printer because the nozzle is so uh, wide that you can't print a very fine tip like this. And in fact, um, we can go and look at the tip diameter, see 0.3 millimeters tip diameter. Uh, my FDM printer has a nozzle that's 0.4 millimeters. So there's no way that I could very easily create a 0.3 millimeter tip with a 0.4 nozzle. Too much material would flow out. So these are pretty good settings generally for SLA and DLP printers. Um, now, again, you're going to need to uh, tune your exposure time and all of that in your DLP printer settings. But this is uh, a pretty good start for um, what you would use. And in fact, um, the, the Ember printers, if you go down here to Autodesk Ember, let me close these out, remove support, generate support. Um, the Autodesk Ember printer, this is the slicing tool that they use for Ember. Um, so that is, that is telling you something because that is a very, very nice printer. Let me go back here to um, Hangouts. See if anybody else has any questions. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so hopefully, um, uh, I mean, that will be give you a good starting point. You know, DLP printing is also about different exposure times. You want to, um, you want to expose your starting layers a little bit longer, actually about 10 times longer to really get it cured to the build plate. And then you can go faster for later layers. All of that is handled in the 3D printer software, um, not in Mesh Mixer, but Mesh Mixer can create the supports uh, for you to use later. Um, so I don't have any other questions in the chat right here. So we'll probably wrap it up uh, pretty soon. Uh, we're happy to go on longer if people have questions or um, in the surveys um, if you ask questions beforehand. But hopefully this has been of use. Um, and Lisa um, spoke out on the chat that this is being recorded. Um, and you'll be uh, emailed after uh, a couple hours after this ends um, a link to the replay um, that you can do, uh, that you can look at it at any time. And uh, so I, again, invite you to uh, put on a review of our class on Mesh Mixer to get access to that mind map. Um, and again, we are so super appreciative of having you as our backers, and we really want to make you successful. So if you have questions or we didn't answer the questions um, specifically perfectly for what you want in this, um, email us, and we're, we're glad to, uh, um, to help. 
or uh, what you can do is post on, um, at this point our class is, is only on Udemy, you can actually go onto Udemy and ask these questions so that other people can benefit from your questions as well. Um, totally happy to answer questions there. So um, thank you so much and uh, I will sign off for now and we will send you out a link and I would hope to see you again on the discussions on the class, uh, on the online sites, uh, personally, or um, if we see you in person here in the San Francisco Bay Area. So thank you so much, and we'll see you soon.